just kind of like share it and then yeah. and then of course once I had it I, I had all these other ideas of like oh this would be funny and like oh this would be so true and uh, I eventually decided like well first of all source some cardboard um, and then <laughs> yeah. and then just started taking photos and grabbing a buddy to like take a quick pic in like a gym or whatever I was doing so yeah I just kind of was like a random funny idea and I just kind of like went with it and then yeah, I just it just picked up a little traction, and um, now yeah, quite a few people are following the page. So, <laughs> welcome to Consistency Breeds Growth Radio. I am your host, Justin Romare. Our incredible guest and myself talk about the cutting edge science and consistency necessary to reach your weight loss, wellness, and performance goals. If you have nutrition goals, we have customized nutrition programs, and coaches that tell you how much, when, and what to eat for every single meal. And the best part? You don't need to calculate macros in an app. Ditch the calculators. Want to learn more about our intrinsic diet? Let one of our coaches know you listen to this podcast to get 10% off. Do you own a gym or attend a gym? that wants to make some money and throw a top-notch nutrition challenge with a team of certified nutrition coaches? Our team will guide your members through a nutrition challenge customized for your gym. And you'll make money for each member who signs up. If you want more information about working with us one-on-one or in a gym setting, head over to consistencybreedsgrowth.com or email us at consistencybreedsgrowth at gmail.com. We will also put links in the show notes. Enjoy the podcast. Science. All right, team, we're back with another episode of CBG Radio, and we have a special guest here today, Kate Gordon. She is a two-time CrossFit Games athlete on a team in 2015 and 2019. She has her level three CrossFit, and she's part of the seminar staff. She's also well-known as being CrossFitter with the sign. If you haven't looked up this Instagram account, I would definitely do so. And uh, it's going to be fun today because she's got a little bit of a different accent than the majority of us listen to this podcast because she's from Australia. So, Kate, nice to hear from you on the podcast. Very excited. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'd like to go through a couple of Australian versus U.S. phrases, trivia, if you will. How does that sound? (laughs) Sounds great. All right. So what do you say? Apartment or flat? Oh, flat. Definitely. What? What is a flat? Like a flat? I should clarify. I'm actually from New Zealand. Like I'm born and raised in New Zealand and I've been in Australia for like seven years. Flat is even more of a Kiwi thing to say. It's super English. It's just like, I don't know where it came from, but it's just like, the, it's a flat. So <laughs> I never heard this before until I looked it up and uh, it's super weird. So everybody in Australia is like, like a, was once in like prison in England, right? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> basically, basically <laughs> it's like Australia was like, if you've got a convict and you don't want him in your town, you just ship him off to this island and it happened to be Australia. <laughs> yeah. So everyone there is a descendant of a criminal. So. Yeah. There's some really cool stories actually about like the butcher or the hanger and like there's all these names for these criminals and there's a, uh, there happens to be this like a uh, pub in um, Sydney that does like their drinks and beers based on these convict stories. It's, it's super crazy, but yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, next is can or tin? Uh, can. Okay. That's I was the like, same. what's a tin? Yeah, can. <laughs> <laughs> We're the same, tin. Okay, this one's super weird. Um, cantaloupe versus rock melon. Melon. Yeah, melon, rock melon. Rock melon? <laughs> yeah, rock melon. <laughs> Never heard of that before in my life. It's just like, I don't even know if I'd even put the rock in there. It's just melon. Just melon, it's okay. Just whatever, whatever you give me, it's always going to be the shorter version. Australians are great at shortening things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now we have candy or lolly. Lolly. A lolly is like a lollipop, which is a type of candy. Yeah, and we'll even call like chocolate candy lollies here. Like, especially if they're like the mini ones, it's just like lollies. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, next two. Uh, Flip flops or thongs. Oh, you're going to get real confused because in New Zealand, we call them jandals. Jandals? <laughs> yeah. That's better it's than like, thong because... 
Yeah, right? So, like, I used to, because I was in New Zealand, so I called them jandals, and then I was in the U.S. for a while, and I uh, called them flip-flops. And now I have to go through, like, all the different words, and I'm trying to translate what I'm talking about when I'm talking about flip-flops. But, yeah, thongs. I can't adjust to that. I haven't, I have not, that, that word doesn't agree with me when I'm talking about my jandals. But, yeah, jandals is, like, you know Javianas? No. Like the brand. Oh, the brand. So like okay. A, yeah, like the brand of flip flops. So Jandals was the New Zealand version. So it just became like associated with the sh- style of shoe, and now it's just everybody refers to them as Jandals, which makes no sense to anybody else in the world. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Not not to me at least. Um, okay, last one: booty or caboose? Like butt? Is that like what a you're butt? Yeah, about? like a butt, like someone's butt. <laughs> Probably booty. Okay, because caboose is like, <laughs> don't people in Australia say that? Yeah, but not 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 regularly. <laughs> not regularly. It's it's like a it's like a joke or caboose is like, yeah, I don't know. It's it's, it's kind of a weird terminology. Someone someone making a strange joke might use it. I don't know. So if not, you're not weird, if used. you're weird, you say it then. So <laughs> got it. All right. In, in a funny way, you might be hilarious and use caboose. Right. Okay, got it. <laughs> like, it might be something that, like, my dad would use and, like, a dad <laughs> joke somehow. You know, like, that would be where it would be used. Okay. <laughs> All right, so don't say that if you go to Australia. You're not cool by saying that. Um, okay, so that concludes our phraseology trivia, if you will. Um, so thanks for sharing that with us. And now we have to get into some CrossFit stuff. So so this CrossFitter with a sign thing that you do, for the, those that, that don't know, Kate actually holds up a sign with like these aha moments of CrossFit and they're amazing because everyone resonates with them and it's, it's on her Instagram CrossFitter with a sign. Where did you like come up with this? It was at a time where there was a bit of a trend on social media to do the sign. Mm -hmm. Like it was, you know, painfully obvious statements that people would just put up on a, on a uh, board and it was almost a little sarcastic or a little bit dry. And so a bunch of people have been doing them and I kind of just had this one come to me that was like, stop picking weights that are too heavy for you <laughs> yeah. in workouts. And so I posted that on, on my own page um, and it just like was super popular. And I had seen another page called Dude with Sign. If you've seen that, he's got a couple mm-hmm. million followers. And I was like, I wonder if there's a CrossFitter with Sign. Like, you know what? I, I'll just I'll just take the handle if, if it's available and I'll just kind of like share it. And then... Yeah. And then, of course, once I had it, I, I had all these other ideas of like, oh, this would be funny and like, oh, this would be so true. And uh, I eventually decided like, well, first of all, sourced some cardboard um, and then <laughs> yeah. and then just started taking photos and grabbing a buddy to like take a quick pic in like a gym or whatever I was doing. So, yeah, I just kind of was like a random funny idea and I just kind of like went with it. And then, yeah, I just it just picked up a little traction. And um, now, yeah, quite a few people are following the page. So. <laughs> Yeah. I was joking because, uh, you know, I've been running CFK for eight years now. It's taken eight years to build up to, I'm at 40,000 followers. So it's like eight years of like, you know, consistent posting and posting stuff with value and telling a story and yep. being transparent and like giving, giving like something that has meaning. And then within like three months of running CrossFit with Sai and I had like 30,000 followers and I was like, man, like, <laughs> I don't get it. Like, I give up. <laughs> You should just switch the pages, like keep Literally, growing out. Like, you know what? If you want like an Instagram following, just write random stuff on cardboard and take photos of it. That'll work. <laughs> Some of the ones I have it up. Uh, cheerleading isn't coaching. That's on a sign. Yeah. Uh, strict before kipping, 100%. Um, let coaches coach. Uh, stop pulling early. All these things that like are just come on guys like this stuff is obvious to people but they need to see it on a sign and look it's yeah. amazing so uh yeah, yeah. follow crossfitter with a sign actually follow cf kate and crossfitter with a sign um both <laughs> accounts are amazing but yeah i just wanted to know a little bit about the backstory about that it's pretty cool um in terms of your like competitive career so you've been to the games twice on the team the affiliate cups coming back you know all these different changes. Are you focused consistently on the business side of everything that you're doing in the CrossFit space? Or are you planning to make any type of return to competing? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I'm hoping to compete again. At the moment with where I'm currently at, this year is not going to be a super competitive year for me. But with the return of the Affiliate Cup, they kind of just change things because we have a pretty competitive affiliate. So if we're putting together teams Mm -hmm. where you cannot have 
people training in different parts of the world or different parts of the country, you know, combined to make a super team, then that's advantageous for our affiliate because we have a bunch of really talented athletes at the gym. So we're training together pretty regularly. So being able to put a team together from that crew could mean that we're really competitive. So that's been something that a few of us are having a conversation around at the moment. Other than that, I think for me, next year will probably be when I'm feeling like I can really compete again. I think um, this past year has definitely thrown me out a little bit. We were in lockdown for like seven months, so we yeah. didn't have gyms open, which was fine. Like I, I feel like I'm good again, and I feel like I'm getting back into the swing of things now that we're all back open. But um, yeah, I think just with the open, with the timing, I'm just not quite there yet, but next year it will be a good year for me. Awesome. Yeah, love to hear it. I think uh, the, the changes are really cool where you have to be in a 100-mile radius uh, of the gym that you plan to compete with. But, you know, there's still like loopholes with this. People are like, you know, yeah. moving across the country and doing all this other stuff. I mean, um, they, they just had something come out about, you know, people on Reddit talking about CrossFit Mayhem, people like transitioning, yeah. moving in and doing this stuff. So, but it's, yeah. it's really cool to have people at your affiliate that are... Um, you know, or you're able to train with and cultivate that competitive environment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, there's always going to be some loopholes and there's always going to be people moving to compete at a different gym, but that's that's been happening for years. Like before the super teams were able to be put together, before that when the affiliate cup used to be around, people would move to compete. So it's not, it's not necessarily anything new. And I think that the gyms that have a competitive culture – kind of like our gym, like I moved to train at our gym um, because that was mm-hmm. where I was being coached out of, which was ultimately kind of why I ended up competing at the 2019 games as well, really. So it's definitely not something that's like new or surprising to me. I think um, people just love to compete and they're going to go and train at the affiliate that gives them the opportunity to do that. Yeah, definitely. What about some of the other changes for this year? So I think it's going to be three weeks right? The yeah. initial component of the, what do you, how do you feel about that? I think Dave came out a couple of days ago and said people were expecting an event a week or a workout a week, and it could be more than that. Right. So there's still so many unknowns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's classic Castro really. Like there's just so much that we won't know until, until we all go through it, which I love. Like, I think, I think that's part of it. And he knows that he knows that the whole goal of CrossFit is to be ready for the unknown and to have some kind of surprise element. Like I, every year that the open comes around, I'm like, there's not going to be any more surprises. Like there's nothing left. And somehow he'll, he'll do something new or do something different. So I expect nothing, you know, less. I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be different. It will be unlike any other open, especially with the challenges that we're facing in the moment. So I'm, I'm personally just excited to see what he brings out. Like I'm excited and I'm also worried because I know that if it's, if it's, you know, just like gut check style workouts where it's very lightweight, it's basic, you know, body weight movements. Um, I, I think it will be a test of people's engines and it won't be until the next stage where you will really test things like some of the more complex gymnastics or weightlifting stuff which is, you know, my preferred stuff. So (laughs) I think the first stage is going to be um, exciting but hard for sure. Yeah, I think it seems like based on the equipment requirements, it's going to look like more body weight, you know, endurance-based stuff in the first couple of weeks, three weeks. Yeah, it'll be like the uh, fundraiser that they did at the beginning of COVID. You know, it'll just be like push-ups, burpees, some dumbbell snatches, like it'll just be basic stuff, which is great. And it's not too far from what the open already is anyway, really. Right, right. It's got a um, low barrier to entry, which is nice. Yeah, it's good. Everybody can sort of uh, partake and, um, yeah. and you know, maybe get that fuel again and that fire to, to get back. I know a lot of people in the U.S. still like with gyms kind of being half open, half not and restricted in terms of capacity, people haven't found like that new schedule, that new groove with their eating, yeah, with yeah. their routine, everything, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we totally felt that last year. I think you guys are in a pretty challenging position for sure. So hopefully, you know, this exactly like you said, gives people something to structure their days around and, and plan for with their training. Right. Yeah, so I think you sort of pointed it out already. Like, what are some of the things people are going to have to do or should have been doing these past couple of months to get ready for the open if they want to do well? Let's start with like stage one. Like, so like, what do you think people are going to have to do well to be able to get to the next stage in the top, you know, 
ninety percent. The ultimate thing that any athlete can do, regardless of your level and regardless of the stage, is get intensity. That will always be the test in the open, and it will always be the test in CrossFit. So, I mean, and when I say intensity, I mean like being able to hurt. So I think an easy way to hurt is doing lightweight movements because there's no reason to stop. <laughs> it's really like, you know, you can, you can do 150 burpees for time. It's so simple and elegant, but yet it's like it could be a very slow workout if you're not willing to hurt. It can be a very fast workout if you're willing to hurt. So I think finding intensity in whatever training you're doing is always going to be the secret. The, the like, I don't want to say the magic pill, but it kind of is. It's like... How much can you lean into the discomfort? How much can you lean into a high heart rate? How much can you lean into the the pain of doing the kind of training that we're doing? And I think that, yeah, the the lighter body weight stuff is kind of the easiest way to get that sometimes. Um, Heavy barbells, complex gymnastics or high volume gymnastics can be more about endurance and technique. So um, I think if everyone's been practicing a lot of, double unders and burpees and light barbell snatches and dumbbell thrusters, like you're going to be fine. Um, But if you haven't been doing it with intensity, then you're in trouble. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I agree with you entirely. I looked up some movement specific stuff for the open in the past, like 10 years. Right. And Mm -hmm. toes to bar and double under showed up the most. They showed up 10 times. Mm -hmm. So whether I don't know if they'll show up in stage one. He did say that there's going to be a bar and that I don't know if he mentioned actually having a jump rope. But if he did, then definitely. Into, I mean, they've showed up every year. They're going to show up at one of the two first stages. Yeah, sure I think you kind of you know that it's like, hey, thrusters, double unders, like you said, toes to bar, pull ups. There's usually like deadlifts and box jumps or push press. I know that there's no machines required right. in the first stage, but in the second stage, you know, you're probably going to see rowing. So, yeah, there's, there's usually a small handful of moves that you're like, well, you know, there's a pretty good chance they'll pop up. It's not a guarantee, but, you know, getting really good at double unders and having the engine or the endurance to do big sets and do it for 10 to 15 minutes, like that's going to carry over pretty well to all of those style or type of movements just purely because of the stimulus that it provides. So I don't think you'd, you'd, you'd be able to, you know, make too many mistakes if you're just training using kind of that as your guide. Like it, it's all going to help overall. Yeah. I think, you know, and some most athletes only need a dose of that really high intensity like twice a week, once or twice a week. For someone highly competitive like yourself, maybe only once a week. Because that's typically what you're going to see in the open anyway. And that dose is, you know, it just takes a little bit of time to recover from. Yeah, I think people get confused with intensity and think that doing more is better. When in fact, if you are doing so much that you cannot hit true intensity in your workout, in the intensity piece of your session, then, you know, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So people doing double days, people doing really, really crazy hard workouts every single day of the week and not having shorter, more slow workouts or not having workouts that challenge you in different ways. I think, like you said, the high intensity piece can be two or three times a week. And then other workouts will be more about getting some more volume in or more about lifting under fatigue. Like it's going to be things where the focus shifts and it's not just about like killing and like uh, flogging yourself for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. So yeah, I mean, I certainly approach my workouts where not every single day is about max intensity like there are definitely a couple sessions in a week at least where it's more about hey like for example last week the workout was it was a huge volume of wobbles that i had to do but Mm -hmm. in between it was a whole lot of heavy snatching and it was three reps per round so it wasn't a lot of reps but there were a lot of rounds and that was a workout where you were just chipping away like it was really a chipper and the intensity was really only as intense as it could be but still allow me to lift successfully. So the dynamic of the workout shifted quite dramatically and, and, and that will be blended into my training pretty regularly where it's not, you know, every day go in and like sprint to the death and then <laughs> and yeah. try and like peel yourself up off the ground afterwards and do, do some other stuff. So yeah, I think you're, you're totally right. And um, intensity can only be, you can only dose yourself up with so much intensity before you kind of either burn out or you have to slow down. So being mindful about what days are your intensity days, are you actually getting the intensity that you need and how much do you need to recover and how much volume can you actually deal with? So it's like, you know, we talk about minimum effective dose versus maximum recoverable dose. And I think 
if you're a gem pop and you're not competitive, the minimum effective dose is what's really important to understand. Right. If you're an athlete, it's the maximum recoverable dose. And I think people forget that recoverable is in there. It's not just maximum dose. It's maximum recoverable dose. And if you have so much volume that you're not recovering, your performance is diving because of that, you're screwing yourself. Yeah, I think the maximum recoverable volume, you say dose, same. But it's super important for athletes to recognize what that threshold is because I mean, that's basically the maximum amount that they of training they could put in. Like if you have a coach that knows that and you know that very well, you're basically getting in the maximum amount of adaptations in a given yeah. week, which is like, that's the greatest thing a coach could do. Um, and if you can do less training doing that in higher intensity, that's ideal, right? I mean, that makes the most exactly. sense. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, people expect toast the bar, body weight, burpees, double unders, and expect to be moving fast. And, uh, you know, it, it's actually not a horrible idea to go back through past open workouts and maybe repeat, oh, pick great. one and repeat, yeah. repeat one once yeah. a week, you know? Yeah, especially because you've got a benchmark, you've got a, you've got a carrot tangled in front of you because if you've got your old score, you can try and challenge that, which is an awesome way to measure your progress and an awesome way to push yourself if you're feeling a little bit like, you know, if people are training from home or training in smaller groups or in an environment that's adjusted for COVID, it's harder to get the intensity sometimes. So having an old score to race against is a helpful way to do that. Yep. No, absolutely. I agree with you. So some other changes, there's going to be a quarterfinals after the top 90, the top 10% finish after week three, uh, and then a semifinals, which is going to be uh, apparently in person if possible. And then the people at the semifinals will go to the games. Uh, so yeah. that's going to be that's going to be almost like a, a a new regional essentially is what it looks like yeah. it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pumped for that. It's going to be cool to see how it works out. And then the last big change, I guess, is the adaptive division. So it looks like it's eight different categories. So it's upper extremity, lower extremity. I think neuromuscular, vision, seated athletes, intellectual. I think all of yeah. those are going to be included this year, which is super exciting. Like it's the most all encompassing open we've ever had, especially for people that don't have a gym and they have yeah. limited workout equipment. Like you just need your body, yeah. you know, which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty phenomenal event. Like, I mean, speaking to a couple of people, like just people with some physical disabilities or adaptive athletes, like it just seems like it's bringing in some really cool excitement and interest from the community like from the adaptive community that perhaps didn't really even consider crossfit before it's like now this is really opening it up for that community which is really cool because uh you know i think we've always probably within the crossfit community seen adaptive athletes and we have the adaptive athlete course from like kevin ogar and mm -hmm. like a few things like that but i think outside of crossfit it probably wasn't really well known that you know we have adaptive athletes so I think this is going to make that really public, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah, more inclusive, absolutely. So I think that that's a pretty mm -hmm. cool change that they're implementing. Okay, so I'd like to shift a little bit over to body image. So you've been like a pioneer mm -hmm. in talking about, especially on your Instagram and through your personal brand, some things that people are just sort of, uh, you know, maybe sensitive topics for some people. They're a little bit uh, afraid to talk about, you know, some of this is, is body image and accepting yourself, loving yourself loving yourself, you know, and I think that this is pretty cool. And for myself, like, look, my wife will say, Oh, I'm, I don't, I don't look the way they want to look. And I'm like, Oh my God, like you look amazing. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. So, yeah. and then men do this too, guys. So like I do the same stuff. It's not just women. So I'm in the mirror and I'm like, what the hell? Like I look terrible today. And she's like, what are you talking about? You know? So like, it's good to understand like first about self-love and about body mm -hmm. image. So I want to know, like from you, because you have a lot more experience probably understanding and researching this, is how do we learn to dislike our bodies in general? Um, well, I think what really happens is we're, we're insecure, right? Like at the heart of it, any kind of difficulty that we have with our body is about an insecurity and we're not okay with being vulnerable about that because vulnerability is seen as something that's weak. So I think where it's really coming from is this fear that we're not going to be accepted or we're not going to be loved and ultimately trying to fix that and trying to repair that and make sure that no one sees that um, because we don't want to be seen as, you know, as having some kind of weakness or having some kind of fault. We want people to perceive us 
and we want to be able to, or people to perceive us well and we want to be able to leave good impressions on people and for people to like us. So that's like, you know, so many things can kind of really boil down to that. It's like, we just don't want to be secure. We just want to ensure that we're accepted and loved. So I think the body image thing is a, like one of the most obvious examples of that because it is something that's in the forefront of our minds because it's what we're looking at. We're looking at ourselves in the mirror. We're looking at other people. We're seeing other people look at us. And so that's a really easy thing to tap into to really prioritize in our lives. So um, I think, you know, the, the whole thing with feeling worried about how we look and, and feeling concerned about whether we we look the way we think we should, it, it can also match up to like, well, what are the what are the expectations? What are the what are the standards that you're trying to measure yourself against? What are the beauty ideals that we're seeing? And like, you know, I think it's pretty easy to look at any format of media, like whether it's movies or magazines or social media now, where it's like, man, there's such an unrealistic standard of beauty that's promoted. And and hopefully, you know, we're gonna see that such change more and more. Or it, it already is. But uh, yeah, it's 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 hard to feel like you're normal and what you're dealing with is the same as everyone else when it looks like everyone else is like killing it, has uh, like shredded bod, like it's just got like this amazing life and it's like all that it does is leave us sitting here feeling insecure about what we've got going on. Um, so I think really the heart of it is just insecurity and, and feeling this really like we really emphasize how other people see us. Like uh, this, I had a really interesting conversation recently where women really overemphasize how much how they look matters to men. And this is just very generalized stuff. And then for men, it's similar, but they often will overemphasize how important being a man is to women. So being a stereotypical like man with a lot of masculine energy, how important that is to women. But for the opposite sex, it's like, we don't care. It's like, you know, you're just saying about your partner. It's like, she's like, man, I don't feel very good about how I look. And you're like, are you insane? Have you not seen your body with my eyeballs? Like, you're incredible. And she's like, no way. Like, I'm just, you know, it's like, we have all these opinions that we create about ourselves. Whereas you're like, I don't see that. How do you see that? And it's the same thing with men often. It's like they feel like they have to be the macho man to, like, impress a woman. And a woman's like, I don't, I don't give a fuck. Would you just listen to me? Can we have a conversation? Like, yeah. don't show me how many, like, how much weight you can lift on the barbell. Like, I don't, I don't care about that. So we place all this importance on things based on how we think we're going to be perceived by others because we just want to be loved and accepted. When, in fact, when we're vulnerable and we open up and we show with the things that we're, we're afraid of, that is seen as the most courageous thing that someone can do. Like being, and that's like a lot of my, funnily enough, I have a page that's like CrossFit, like CrossFit Kate. <laughs> and all my posts that have become more like popular or viral have been stuff of it's me like wearing a sports bra and shorts being like, Hey guys, look, I don't have a six pack. And I'm like, man, this is, this is the <laughs> worst social media tactic ever. But those are the things that people are like, holy shit. Like that is so cool to see because I'm just like, you know what? Let me just be vulnerable for a minute and just be like, look, I don't look like everybody else you see on social media or you see in magazines, and that's okay because fucking we don't have to look like that. Like you don't have to, and that's cool. And and I'm just gonna be like open and vulnerable for a minute and be like, P.S. I'm not perfect. And everyone's like, Oh my god, I'm not perfect either. And you have this like sudden like connection with people. So I think learning to be like, it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to not meet these unrealistic standards, and it's okay to feel insecure, and it's cool to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of information here. I think that you, you're spot on. And um, I think the media and the way that everybody is portraying others to make a sale or do whatever it is that they need to do is definitely changing. And people are starting to understand the integrity behind companies outside of a transformation photo or, you know, just yeah, showing this yeah. beautiful model that's really, it's, that's some standard of beauty that someone's made up, right? And I yeah. think uh, it's that that's just difficult for some people. So what do you think, like, obviously, like being vulnerable, though, like, that's a great thing, right? Like, how does someone get to the point where they can start to make steps forward in terms of not feeling insecure about the way that they look besides like the training and nutrition and fitness and trying to improve their overall health and wellness? Yeah, I think... Um... I mean, it's, that's like a really hard question to answer. It's like everybody's a little bit different. Um, I think the, the first step really is probably just awareness, like building self-awareness of mm -hmm. 
how you are in fact thinking or talking about yourself. And it could be the way that you talk to yourself, or it could be how you're talking about yourself to other people. Um, I think that, that sometimes really just has to be the, the very first step. It's like there's actually no action to take. It, it's purely like just just becoming aware of what you think every time you look in the mirror. Is it positive or is it negative? Are you like constantly kind of selling yourself on how shitty your body is, which is, you know, ridiculous. It's like you're constantly overemphasizing the bad. You're constantly crit criticizing yourself. Like, do you ever look for the good stuff? At all, at any point, is there anything that you celebrate when you look in the mirror? Like, it, like, what is it that you like about yourself? And I think sometimes that can be the first moment of, I have a really hard time seeing good things in myself. I have mm -hmm. a really hard time just accepting what I've got going on. And I think um, people think that they have to jump from like really feeling unhappy with their body to just loving it the way it is, even though they're not satisfied with it. And it's like, no, the, the first step is to, one, become aware of, like, how you're, how you're viewing yourself. And to, two, just be, be, be accepting of it. Like, just to kind of be okay with it, to build this sort of body neutrality in a sense where it's like you don't necessarily hate it, but maybe you don't love it either. You're just somewhere in the middle where it's, it is the way it is. This is the body that you get this life. Like, this is the body that you have for this, this time that you spent on Earth. And then at the end of it, like, it's gone. You don't get to change bodies. I'm sorry. I know that sucks, but this is it. So, you know, I think that that can be maybe the first step that you take where it's like, okay, awareness and then just acceptance. And I think um, one thing that has helped me, funnily enough, has probably been through coaching other people. Mm -hmm. Because what you begin to realize really, really quickly is that every single person you talk to is going through exactly the same stuff. Yeah. Like we are all suffering unnecessarily in the same ways. And it's all very private. It's all very secretive. We kind of keep it to ourselves as we're wandering around this planet and we're kind of looking at other people. We're constantly comparing ourselves and worrying and, and wondering how they see us. But you know, the, the reality is that no one else gives a fuck about how you look because they're so busy worrying about how they look. Yeah. It's like this really funny thing where we're so worried about it, but no one's even paying attention because they're so busy being worried about their own stuff. So I think um, having a little perspective, so where it's one, realizing that people actually don't worry as much about that stuff as we do. And then two, realizing that the way we see ourselves is not the way that other people see us. So what we look at in the mirror, we highlight and we magnify the flaws they see us as, one, a whole picture, mm -hmm. and two, as the person that we are, not just how we look like on the outside, you know? Absolutely. It's like I can spend a whole day with someone, like especially if it's a friend, and I get home the next day and I'm like, I have no idea what they were even wearing because I wasn't paying attention to it. Right. I'm talking to them and I'm connecting to them and I'm seeing their face and I'm feeling their energy and I'm hearing their voice. It's like I don't pay attention to Like I just realized the other day one of my friends, she's covered in tattoos, and I was like, man, she's got such amazing tattoos. And I'm like, she's always had them. I just <laughs> never see them because I don't look at it like that. You know, I don't see her in that way. I don't see her for like the physical like thing that she presents to me. It's like, it, it's hers on, on the whole. So I think when we can realize that what other people see is not what we see. So if we can trade out our eyeballs for their eyeballs for just a moment, we could see the positives in ourselves. And then the even bigger perspective from that is that in life, the weight on the scale or the abs that we have is not the most important thing. Like it really isn't. And, and if we can apply that every day, every morning when we, when we wake up, I think we can make much better use of our time and energy than perhaps what we would have if we had left it unexamined. If we had just kind of been like, you know what, I just like, I don't like my body and I don't want to deal with it. I want to do all these things to try and fix it. I'm going to buy into this marketing and it's telling me that I need to change. It's giving me all these like secret like magic pills to do it. It's like, hey, no, like that, if you can just examine where that's coming from, you feel a little vulnerable, you're worried you're not going to be accepted. Do you have people that love you? Yes. Do you have things that you can do with your time that's perhaps a better investment than always being worried about what your body looks on the outside? Like, I think if we can just really examine how we're, how we're talking about ourselves, how we're spending our time, what our values are, like it can help, I guess, help dissipate some of those fears and some of those insecurities because they suddenly become very small relative to the big, the big problems in life, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, people, 
those are some great tips for people that struggle with this. And I just want to get your perspective on one more thing. I think that Mm -hmm. when it comes to this, it may not even be about the nutrition. It may not even be about the body image. That's just something that they can see. They have deeper rooted issues. All of us do in terms of our insecurities, uh, who we are, how we speak or what we do for a living, all of it. And the one thing that we can pinpoint is when we see with our eyes visually, Mm. when we do that, we attribute all of our self-doubt on the way that we look. Um, And I want to know if you think that there's more complex issues with people. And then what does that mean for nutrition coaches moving forward? Because people that want to improve themselves think it's only about the way that they look and then they come to a nutrition coach like me or you and we have to be able to sort of work around and navigate a lot of different issues outside of calories in calories out right yeah yeah i mean the amount of time that i spend with people talking about food versus just general life like (laughs) the the ratio of it is pretty (laughs) kind of interesting considering i'm like hey I can tell you all about macros and people are like, you know, we just end up in these conversations where it's like, we're not, we're not talking about macros that much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I think, um, I think you have to be mindful of like, you know, what is your scope of practice sometimes? And, and are you helping people or, or are you hindering people? Like at some point, sometimes people probably need to go and get therapy. Like people should be getting therapy. I think that's such a great thing to utilize. And I, and I think that, like you said, we think that it's food. We think that it's weight loss that's going to solve our problems, but it wasn't the weight that was the problem in the first place. How we feel about ourselves was just a symptom of something else that's going on. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I think um, that can definitely, for coaches, present a much bigger challenge than perhaps what you know we signed up for, becoming coaches or nutrition coaches. Um, I guess what it is sometimes is, really asking more questions like I think as a coach one of your best tools and as a leader as well which I think you know affiliate coaches and affiliate owners you're you're leaders of a community and I think if you learn how to listen and how to ask questions like the right kind of questions you can learn a lot about people and uh just in doing that just that on its own well, I mean, caring as well, right? Like step one is care. Yeah, yeah. But step two is ask questions and, and listen. I think you can kind of learn a lot about people and people will be willing to tell you what's going on. Um, and, and you might find that there's, there's more stuff happening under the surface, which can be where what I've gotten to, which is a lot of the time I actually don't necessarily get people to focus on weight loss or losing weight or being in a calorie deficit. Some of the time it's like, hey, can we just learn how to just be healthy and mm-hmm. simultaneously learn to just accept where our bodies are at right now and, and just learn to just, just you know, sit with that and, and be okay with it just for now. And, like, you know, we'll, we'll keep on trying to do that every day. And sometimes that's what the goal really needs to be, even though they come to me saying, like, oh, I'm desperate to lose weight. Like, I just I hate where I'm at. Like, I just got back from Christmas and New Year's, like, vacation or holiday, and, like, I just feel awful. My training's been, like, just terrible because I'm training at home and I'm alone. Like, I just really dislike it. I really want to lose weight. And I'm like, hey, like, mm-hmm. no, I don't think I don't think weight loss is, is really the, the thing that's going to provide the relief for you. Like, we need to focus on how you're thinking about yourself and your body and, like, what's making you unhappy. And Because I think, like, here's the thing. Here's what – here, let me simplify this. What people want with weight loss is happiness. That's what we're really after. What people want with weight gain, what people want with any change in their body, anything with their training, what we're really after is some source of happiness because we think that when we attain that goal, we'll feel good about ourselves. So what we need to realize is that the goal isn't actually the weight change or the the whatever it is in training or the whatever the goal is. The goal is how you feel. And what we can do is we can actually go about finding ways to make you feel that way without doing anything about your weight loss, weight gain, weight, whatever, your abs, like whatever those things are. We can do things 
that will just serve to make you a happier person. And it might just be focusing on being healthy. It might be learning to journal. It might be doing things like breathing and walking for 10 minutes each day. Like it might be these little things that just serve to make us happier in the present moment. And I think that that, when we connect the, the, the um, I guess, more superficial goal with that being what they really want, when we make that connection, then we can actually strive towards what the real goal is. And that changes everything. Yeah. Yeah. Holy crap. So like basically, I mean, if you think about it, it, it to break it down even further, every, this whole life is about optimizing happiness. Like whether you get it through religion yeah. or you get it through your training or your career or your kids, your wife, your husband, whoever it is, uh, this whole thing's about happiness, right? So like you figuring out the mechanism to get you to happiness is very important because that mechanism mm -hmm. might not be through weight loss and mm. the scale mm. it might be through something mm. totally totally different and yeah. maybe something occurred in your life that made you unhappy you started <clears throat> overeating and now as a result of overeating and stress from being unhappy you are overweight and you think that being back to mm. your old body weight is going to unlock that happiness that you once had and that's yeah. pro probably not true and i love yeah. that you brought up therapy right because like at least in the u.s that was something frowned upon years ago. Mm -hmm. Like if you went to therapy, you were like a crazy like psycho. Now everyone's like, look, if you have something that you need to get off your chest, you want to be vulnerable and you need someone to guide you through and navigate you through some of the issues that you're having, whether it be anxiety or whatever it is, people mm -hmm. are seeing therapists now and it's not something that's frowned upon. It never should have been. And I think that that's a huge first step for a lot of people that are having issues that have constantly been brought up in their life that they can't somehow navigate through on their own, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, cause I mean, how often do people actually accomplish the goal and get there and they're like, well, now what? Like, I don't feel the way I thought I was going to feel. I'll just make a new goal. And it's like, people kind of get to the end point and they're not satisfied or they don't feel the way they thought they were going to feel. They don't, they don't feel that happiness that they had sitting on the other side of their goalposts. And it's because that wasn't, that wasn't the right thing. That wasn't the right way to go about doing it. Like, yes, you've accomplished something amazing, but if you didn't realize that what you were looking for was how you feel, then no matter, you know, what physical thing you accomplish or what, you know, like a external thing that you've attained, no matter what happens, if you're internally not getting it right, then it will always feel like something's amiss. Yeah. Absolutely. And it just leaves people off target for, and it could be for years and years and years. They're just, they're not where they want to be. So I think, uh, yeah, that's super awesome. And in terms of like nutrition coaches, I don't know if you feel this way. You've already sort of said that you're helping people navigate through issues when they sign up for nutrition coaching and lose weight that are, aren't related to weight loss at all. I think that companies that are doing that uh, and this com maybe came out a result of COVID-19. We have to continue to show empathy as coaches. We have to understand people ask the right questions, like you said. Uh, and this goes for gym owners too. It's not just, you know, people like gym owners, like I, at least this is the way I see it. These people aren't signing up for a gym membership. Mm -hmm. Like they're signing up for a goal, right? Like they have goals and they think those goals might be weight loss or fitness or wellness or healthy, but they don't actually want to buy a, mem a gym membership. They're like, yeah, I'm going to go buy a gym membership. Yeah. Nobody wants to yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I think that yeah, that's, exactly. yeah, it's super important that people, uh, you know, you're there as a gym owner, or as a coach um, to be that hand that's like, hey we hear you, we see you, we want you to reach your goals too. And asking the questions as to why it is that they want to reach those goals. And you're spot on when you said earlier, like you'd be surprised what people tell you when you ask them, like, just ask them, like, what are your goals outside of nutrition and fitness? What are your personal goals? What are your financial goals? Do you have any, tra do you want to travel this year? If you ask your members at your gym that or your clients that you would be f freaking amazed as to how yeah. much information they reveal to you about their lives it's absolutely it's stunning yeah it's amazing yeah, yeah. um and this was uh this was such an informative podcast i think that our, our listeners are going to take so much away from you here kate especially about body image you're talking about on your instagram you uh 
you, you talk about things that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about in your pioneering, uh, you know, things for women to uh, love their bodies and understand uh, why it is that they should love their bodies. You're talking about online dating. You're talking about sex. You're talking about all these things. And I think it's it's super empowering to see women doing that. So, um, yeah, we, yeah, we like loved the, you. The yeah. ultimate oversharer. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You're vulnerable, right? And that's why you're <laughs> that's why you you are where you want to be. And you can post pics where. You don't have this shredded six pack abs and show the world that they don't need to either. So, yeah, um, it's amazing. I think um, in doing that, it's built my confidence for sure. It's been like this as much as people are like, wow, like your message is really helping me. I'm like, man, posting this stuff is really helping me. Like, yeah. that, that funnily enough has been what's really happened. Like, people think that I speak really well and that I'm confident and that I have all this information and it's, it's not because I just happen to be that way. It's because I've worked through a lot of this stuff publicly and talked about it and kind of opened up, you know, what's going on to people that I know are probably going through something similar. And it's like, Hey, I, I can share my story. Like I know that maybe some people won't, won't get it, but that's okay. And the more that I share, the more confident I feel and the more comfortable I feel and the better I am at, at accepting what I've got going on. And then in that way, the better I am at appreciating what I've got going on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's super cool that you give to your community and they like give back to you in a way. Um, yeah, and, gotcha. yeah, yeah it's just all, all confidence all around and you're like super authentic on your page which uh is how i feel everyone wants to come through they want to show their true selves and be accepted for their true selves so uh definitely kudos to you and uh yeah if you guys want to you know work with kate in any capacity uh either through understanding a little bit more about training and fitness or nutrition or you just need somebody to uh you know talk to about some of these issues she she uh she has some coaching options available we'll put everything in the show notes all right mate thanks for coming on <laughs> yeah absolutely thank you uh, that was talk- convincing i'm sold you're you're basically one of us now <laughs> i'm coming and uh i'm coming to australia one day and That'd we'll have awesome. to connect then i think yeah awesome kate thanks for coming on yeah, today absolutely. thank you for having me it's science thank you for listening to the podcast today we hope you enjoyed it keep tuning in every week for more incredible guests and ways to reach your max potential both physically and mentally Please subscribe on iTunes or your preferred podcast app and let us know if you like this episode. Science. Don't forget to check us out at consistencybreedsgrowth.com Science. or on Instagram at Science. cbg underscore online underscore sports Science. for details on upcoming nutrition challenges or one-on-one coaching for weight loss, wellness, or performance. Also, feel free to join our free Facebook page at www dot facebook.com slash groups slash cbg nutrition tribe